Aircraft Carrier An aircraft carrier is a warship that serves as a seagoing airbase, equipped with a full-length flight deck and facilities for carrying, arming, deploying, and recovering aircraft. Typically, it is the capital ship of a fleet, as it allows a naval force to project air power worldwide without depending on local bases for staging aircraft operations. Carriers have evolved since their inception in the early 20th century from wooden vessels used to deploy balloons to nuclear-powered warships that carry numerous fighters, strike aircraft, helicopters, and other types of aircraft. While heavier aircraft such as fixed-wing gunships and bombers have been launched from aircraft carriers, it is currently not possible to land them. By its diplomatic and tactical power, its mobility, its autonomy and the variety of its means, the aircraft carrier is often the centerpiece of modern combat fleets. Tactically or even strategically, it replaced the battleship in the role of flagship of a fleet. One of its great advantages is that, by sailing in international waters, it does not interfere with any territorial sovereignty and thus obviates the need for overflight authorizations from third-party countries, reduce the times and transit distances of aircraft and therefore significantly increase the time of availability on the combat zone. There is no single definition of an aircraft carrier, and modern navies use several variants of the type. These variants are sometimes categorized as subtypes of aircraft carriers, and sometimes as distinct types of naval aviation-capable ships. Aircraft carriers may be classified according to the type of aircraft they carry in their operational assignments. Admiral Sir Mark Stanhope, RN, former First Sea Lord, head, of the Royal Navy, has said, to put it simply, countries that aspire to strategic international influence have aircraft carriers. Henry Kissinger while United States Secretary of State, also said, an aircraft carrier is 100,000 tons of diplomacy. As of, there are 41 active aircraft carriers in the world operated by 13 navies. The United States Navy has 11 large nuclear-powered fleet carriers, carrying around 80 fighter jets each, the largest carriers in the world. The total combined deck space is over twice that of all other nations combined. As well as the aircraft carrier fleet. The U.S. Navy has nine amphibious assault ships used primarily for helicopters, although these also carry up to 20 vertical or short takeoff and landing, v slash fighter jets and are similar in size to medium-sized fleet carriers. China, France, India, Russia, and the U.K. each operate a single large-slash-medium-sized carrier, with capacity from 30 to 60 fighter jets. Italy operates two light fleet carriers and Spain operates one. Helicopter carriers are operated by Japan, 4, France, 3, Australia, 2, Egypt, 2, Brazil, 1, South Korea, 1, and Thailand, 1. Future aircraft carriers are under construction or in planning by Brazil, China, India, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. A fleet carrier is intended to operate with the main fleet and usually provides an offensive capability. These are the largest carriers capable of fast speeds. By comparison, escort carriers were developed to provide defense for convoys of ships. They were smaller and slower with lower numbers of aircraft carried. Most were built from mercantile hulls or, in the case of merchant aircraft carriers, were bulk cargo ships with a flight deck added on top. Light aircraft carriers were fast enough to operate with the main fleet but of smaller size with reduced aircraft capacity. Soviet aircraft carriers now in use by Russia are actually called heavy aviation cruisers. These ships, while sized in the range of large fleet carriers, were designed to deploy alone or with escorts, and provide both strong defensive weaponry and heavy offensive missiles equivalent to a guided missile cruiser, in addition to supporting fighters and helicopters. Aircraft carriers today are usually divided into the following four categories based on the way that aircraft take off and land. The Appalachian Supercarrier is not an official designation with any national navy, but a term used predominantly by the media and typically when reporting on new and upcoming aircraft carrier types. It is also used when comparing carriers of various sizes and capabilities, both current and past. It was first used by the New York Times in 1938, in an article about the Royal Navies that had a length of, a displacement of 22,000 tons and was designed to carry 72 aircraft. Since then, aircraft carriers have consistently grown in size, both in length and displacement, as well as improved capabilities, in defense, sensors, electronic warfare, propulsion, range, launch and recovery systems, number and types of aircraft carried and number of sorties flown per day. While the current classes in service, or planned, with the navies of China, India, 
Russia, and the United Kingdom, with displacements ranging from 65,000 to 85,000 tons, lengths ranging from 280 meters, 920 feet, to 320 meters, 1,050 feet, and varying capabilities, have been described as supercarriers. The largest supercarriers currently in service are with the U.S. Navy, with displacements exceeding 100,000 tons, lengths of over 337 meters, 1,106 feet, and capabilities that match or exceed that of any other class. Several systems of identification symbol for aircraft carriers and related types of ship have been used. These include the pennant numbers used by the Royal Navy and some Commonwealth countries, the hull classification symbols used by the U.S., NATO and some other countries, and the Canadian hull classification symbols. The 1903 advent of heavier-than-air fixed-wing aircraft with the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, was closely followed on 14 November 1910, by Eugene Burton Ely's first experimental takeoff of a Curtis Pusher airplane from the deck of a United States Navy ship, the cruiser anchored off Norfolk Navy Base in Virginia. Two months later, on January 18, 1911, Ely landed his Curtis Pusher airplane on a platform on the armored cruiser USS Pennsylvania anchored in San Francisco Bay. On May 9, 1912, the first airplane takeoff from a ship underway was made from the deck of the Royal Navy's pre-dreadnought battleship. Seaplane tender support ships came next, with the French of 1911. Early in World War I, the Imperial Japanese Navy ship conducted the world's first successful ship-launched air raid, on September 6, 1914. A Farman aircraft launched by Wakamiya attacked the Austro-Hungarian cruiser and the Imperial German gunboat Jaguar in Pachau Bay off Tsingtao, neither was hit. The first carrier-launched airstrike was the Tondern raid in July 1918.7 SOP with camels launched from the converted battle cruiser damaged the German airbase at Tondern, Germany, modern-day Tuner, Denmark, and destroyed two Zeppelin airships. The development of flat-top vessels produced the first large fleet ships. In 1918, became the world's first carrier capable of launching and recovering naval aircraft. As a result of the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, which limited the construction of new heavy surface combat ships, most early aircraft carriers were a conversions of ships that were laid down, or had served, as different ship types, cargo ships, cruisers, battle cruisers, or battleships. These conversions gave rise to the USS, 1927, Japanese, and British. Specialist carrier revolution was well underway, with several navies ordering and building warships that were purposefully designed to function as aircraft carriers by the mid-1920s. This resulted in the commissioning of ships such as the Japanese 1922, followed by, 1924, although laid down before HOSHO in 1918, and, 1927. During World War II, these ships would become known as fleet carriers. The aircraft carrier dramatically changed naval combat in World War II, because air power was becoming a significant factor in warfare. The advent of aircraft as focal weapons was driven by the superior range, flexibility, and effectiveness of carrier launched aircraft. They had greater range and precision than naval guns, making them highly effective. The versatility of the carrier was demonstrated in November 1940, when launched a long range strike on the Italian fleet at their base in Taranto signaling the beginning of the effective and highly mobile aircraft strike stop this operation in the shallow water harbor incapacitated three of the anchored six battleships at a cost of two torpedo bombers. World War II in the Pacific Ocean involved clashes between aircraft carrier fleets. The Japanese surprise attack on the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor Naval, air bases on Sunday December 7, 1941 was a clear illustration of the power projection capability afforded by a large force of modern carriers. Concentrating six carriers in a single unit turned naval history about, as no other nation had fielded anything comparable. Further versatility was demonstrated during the Doolittle Raid, on April 18, 1942, when U.S. Navy carrier sailed to within 650 nautical miles of Japan and launched 16 B-25 bombers from her deck in a retaliatory strike on the mainland, including the capital, Tokyo. However, the vulnerability of carriers compared to traditional battleships when forced into a gun range encounter was quickly illustrated by the sinking of by German battleships during the Norwegian campaign in 1940. This newfound importance of naval aviation forced nations to create a number of carriers, in efforts to provide air superiority cover for every major fleet in order to ward off enemy aircraft. This extensive usage led to the development and construction of light carriers. 
escort aircraft carriers, such as, were sometimes purpose-built but most were converted from merchant ships as a stopgap measure to provide anti-submarine air support for convoys and amphibious invasions. Following this concept, light aircraft carriers built by the U.S., such as, represented a larger, more militarized version of the escort carrier. Although with similar complement to escort carriers, they had the advantage of speed from their converted cruiser hulls. The UK 1942 design light fleet carrier was designed for building quickly by civilian shipyards and with an expected service life of about three years. They served the Royal Navy during the war, and the hull design was chosen for nearly all aircraft carrier equipped navies after the war, until the 1980s. Emergencies also spurred the creation or conversion of highly unconventional aircraft carriers. CAM ships were cargo carrying merchant ships that could launch but not retrieve a single fighter aircraft from a catapult to defend the convoy from long range land based German aircraft. Before World War II, International Naval Treaties of 1922, 1930, and 1936 limited the size of capital ships, including carriers. Since World War II, aircraft carrier designs have increased in size to accommodate a steady increase in aircraft size. The large, modern of USN carriers has a displacement nearly four times that of the World War II era, yet its complement of aircraft is roughly the same, a consequence of the steadily increasing size and weight of individual military aircraft over the years. Today's aircraft carriers are so expensive that nations which operate them risk significant political, economic, social and military impact if a carrier is lost, or is even sent to a potential crisis zone or used in conflict. Modern navies that operate such aircraft carriers treat them as the capital ship of the fleet, a role previously held by the sailing galleons, frigates and ships of the line and later steam or diesel-powered battleship. This change took place during World War II in response to air power becoming a significant factor in warfare, driven by the superior range, flexibility and effectiveness of carrier-launched aircraft. Following the war, carrier operations continued to increase in size and importance, and along with Carrier designs also increased in size and ability. Some of those larger carriers, dubbed by the media as supercarriers, displacing 75,000 tons or greater, have become the pinnacle of carrier development. Some are powered by nuclear reactors and form the core of a fleet designed to operate far from home. Amphibious assault ships, such as the in classes, serve the purpose of carrying and landing marines, and operate a large contingent of helicopters for that purpose. Also known as commando carriers or helicopter carriers, many have the capability to operate still aircraft. Lacking the firepower of other warships, carriers by themselves are considered vulnerable to attack by other ships, aircraft, submarines, or missiles. Therefore, an aircraft carrier is generally accompanied by a number of other ships to provide protection for the relatively unwieldy carrier, to carry supplies and perform other support services, and to provide additional offensive capabilities. The resulting group of ships is often termed a battle group, carrier group, carrier battle group or carrier strike group. There is a view among some military pundits that modern anti-ship weapon systems, such as torpedoes and missiles, or even ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads have made aircraft carriers and carrier groups obsolete as too vulnerable for modern combat. On the other hand, the threatening role of aircraft carriers has a place in modern asymmetric warfare, like the gunboat diplomacy of the past. Furthermore, aircraft carriers facilitate quick and precise projections off overwhelming military power into such local and regional conflicts. Carriers are large and long ships, although there is a high degree of variation depending on their intended role and aircraft complement. The size of the carrier has varied over history and among navies, to cater to the various roles that global climates have demanded from naval aviation. Regardless of size, the ship itself must house their complement of aircraft with space for launching, storing, and maintaining them. Space is also required for the large crew, supplies, food, munitions, fuel, engineering parts, and propulsion. U.S. aircraft carriers are notable for having nuclear reactors powering their systems and propulsion. This makes the carrier reasonably tall. The top of the carrier is the flight deck, where aircraft are launched and recovered. On the starboard side of this is the island, where air traffic control and feepers are located. The constraints of constructing a flight deck affect the role of a given carrier strongly, as they influence the weight, type, and configuration of the aircraft that may be launched. For example, assisted launch mechanisms are used primarily for heavy aircraft, 
especially those loaded with air-to-ground weapons. Catabar is most commonly used on U.S. and fleet carriers as it allows the deployment of heavy jets with full loadouts, especially on ground attack missions. Stove less used by other navies because it is cheaper to operate and still provides good deployment capability for fighter aircraft. Due to the busy nature of the flight deck, only 20 or so aircraft may be on it at any one time. A hangar storage several decks below the flight deck is where most aircraft are kept, and aircraft are taken from the lower storage decks to the flight deck through the use of an elevator. The hangar is usually quite large and can take up several decks of vertical space. Munitions are commonly stored on the lower decks because they are highly explosive. Usually this is below the waterline so that the area can be flooded in case of emergency. As runways at sea, aircraft carriers have a flat top flight deck, which launches and recovers aircraft. Aircraft launch forward, into the wind, and are recovered from astern. The flight deck is where the most notable differences between a carrier and a land runway are found. Creating such a surface at sea poses constraints on the carrier. For example, the fact that it is a ship means that a full length runway would be costly to construct and maintain. This affects takeoff procedure as a shorter runway length of the deck requires that aircraft accelerate more quickly to gain lift. This either requires a thrust boost, a vertical component to its velocity, or a reduced takeoff load, to lower mass. The differing types of deck configuration, as above, influence the structure of the flight deck. The form of launch assistance a carrier provides is strongly related to the types of aircraft embarked and the design of the carrier itself. There are two main philosophies in order to keep the deck short, add thrust to the aircraft, such as using a catapult-assisted takeoff, cato, and changing direction of the airplane's thrust, as in vertical and or short takeoff, VSTO. Each method has advantages and disadvantages of its own. On the recovery side of the flight deck, the adaptation to the aircraft loadout is mirrored. Non-VTOL or conventional aircraft cannot decelerate on their own, and almost all carriers using them must have arrested recovery systems, bar, for example Cato bar or STO bar, to recover their aircraft. Aircraft that are landing extend a tail hook that catches on arrestor wires stretched across the deck to bring themselves to a stop in a short distance. Post World War II Royal Navy research on safer catabar recovery eventually led to universal adoption of a landing area angled off axis to allow aircraft who missed the resting wires to bolt and safely return to flight for another landing attempt rather than crashing into aircraft on the forward deck. If the aircraft are VTOL capable or helicopters, they do not need to decelerate and hence there is no such need. The arrested recovery system has used an angletic since the 1950s because, in case the aircraft does not catch the arresting wire, the short deck allows easier takeoff by reducing the number of objects between the aircraft and the end of the runway. It also has the advantage of separating the recovery operation area from the launch area. Helicopters and aircraft capable of vertical or short takeoff and landing. V slash stall, usually recover by coming abreast of the carrier on the port side and thinnessing their hover capability to move over the flight deck and land vertically without the need for a resting gear. Carriers steam at speed, up to into the wind during flight deck operations to increase wind speed over the deck to a safe minimum. This increase in effective wind speed provides a higher launch air speed for aircraft at the end of the catapult stroke or ski jump as well as making recovery safer by reducing the difference between the relative speeds of the aircraft and ship. Since the early 1950s on conventional carriers it has been the practice to recover aircraft at an angle to port of the axial line of the ship. The primary function of this angled deck is to allow aircraft that miss the arresting wires, referred to as a bolter, to become airborne again without the risk of hitting aircraft parked forward. The angled deck allows the installation of one or two waste catapults in addition to the two bow cats. An angled deck also improves launch and recovery cycle flexibility with the option of simultaneous launching and recovery of aircraft. Conventional, tail hook, aircraft rely upon a landing signal officer, LSO, radio call sign paddles, to monitor the aircraft's approach, visually gauge glide slope, attitude, and airspeed, and transmit that data to the pilot. Before the angled deck emerged in the 1950s, LSOs used colored paddle stow signal corrections to the pilot, hence the nickname. From the late 1950s onward, visual landing aids such as the optical landing system have provided information on proper glide slope, but LSOs still transmit voice calls to approaching pilots by radio. Key personnel involved in the flight deck include the shooters, the handler, and the air boss. Shooters are naval aviators or naval flight officers and are responsible for launching aircraft. 
The handler works just inside the island from the flight deck and is responsible for the movement of aircraft before launching and after recovery. The air boss, usually a commander, occupies the top bridge, primary flight control, also called primary or the tower, and has the overall responsibility for controlling launch, recovery and those aircraft in the air near the ship, and the movement of planes on the flight deck, which itself resembles a well-choreographed ballet. The captain of the ship spends most of his time one level below primary on the navigation bridge. Below this is the flag bridge, designated for the embarked admiral and his staff. To facilitate working on the flight deck of a U.S. aircraft carrier, the sailors wear colored shirts that designate their responsibilities. There are at least seven different colors worn by flight deck personnel for modern United States Navy carrier air operations. Carrier operations of other nations use similar color schemes. The superstructure of a carrier, such as the bridge, flight control tower, are concentrated in a relatively small area called an island, a feature pioneered on in 1923. While the island is usually built on the starboard side of the flight deck, the Japanese aircraft carriers and had their islands built on the port side. Very few carriers have been designed or built without an island. The flush deck configuration proved to have significant drawbacks, primary of which was management of the exhaust from the power plant. Fumes coming across the deck were a major issue in. In addition, lack of an island meant difficulties managing flight deck, performing air traffic control, a lack of radar housing placements and problems with navigating and controlling the ship itself. Another deck structure that can be seen is a ski jump ramp at the forward end of the flight deck. This was first developed to help launch stove aircraft takeoff at far higher weights than is possible with a vertical or rolling takeoff on flat decks. Originally developed by the Royal Navy, it since has been adopted by many navies for smaller carriers. A ski jump ramp works by converting some of the forward rolling movement of the aircraft into vertical velocity and is sometimes combined with the aiming of jet thrust partly downwards. This allows heavily loaded and fueled aircraft a few more precious seconds to attain sufficient air velocity and lift to sustain normal flight. Without a ski jump launching fully loaded and fueled aircraft such as the Harrier would not be possible on a smaller flat deck ship before either stalling out or crashing directly into the sea. Although stove aircraft are capable of taking off vertically from a spot on the deck, using the ramp and a running start is far more fuel efficient and there meets a heavier launch weight. As catapults are unnecessary, carriers with this arrangement reduce weight, complexity, and space needed for complex steam or electromagnetic launching equipment. Vertical landing aircraft also remove the need for arresting cables and related hardware. Russian, Chinese, and future Indian carriers include a ski jump ramp for launching lightly loaded conventional fighter aircraft but recover using traditional carrier arresting cables and a tail hook on their aircraft. The disadvantage of the ski jump is the penalty it exacts on aircraft size, payload, and fuel load, and thus range. Heavily laden aircraft cannot launch using a ski jump because their high loaded weight requires either a longer takeoff roll than is possible on a carrier deck, or assistance from a catapult or hot or rocket. For example, the Russian Su-33 is only able to launch from the carrier with a minimal armament and fuel load. Another disadvantage is on mixed flight deck operations where helicopters are also present such as a U.S. landing helicopter dock or landing helicopter assault amphibious assault ship a ski jump is not included as this would eliminate one or more helicopter landing areas. This flat deck limits the loading of Harriers but is somewhat mitigated by the longer rolling start provided by a long flight deck compared to many Stovall carriers. The U.S. Navy has the largest carriers in the world, and currently has 11 in service. The UK operates 165,000-ton Stovall carrier. The navies of China, France, India, and Russia each operate a single medium-sized fleet carrier. The US has nine similarly sized amphibious warfare ships. There are three small light carriers in use capable of operating both fixed-wing aircraft and helicopters. Italy operates two, and Spain one. Additionally, there are 14 small carriers which only operate helicopters serving the navies of Australia, two. Brazil, 1, Egypt, 2, France, 3, Japan, 4, South Korea, 1, and Thailand, 1. The Atlantic helicopter docks is based on the Spanish vessel. The two-ship class, built by Navantia and BAE Systems Australia, represents the largest ships ever built for the Royal Australian Navy. The Brazilian Navy commissioned the multi-purpose amphibious assault ship and helicopter carrier on 29 June in the United Kingdom which was renamed Atlantico. 
The helicopter carrier package for Brazil includes an artisan 3D search radar, KH-1007 surface surveillance radar system, four 30mm DS-30M MK-2 remote weapon systems and four MK-5B landing craft. However, the three original 20mm MK-15 Block 1B phalanx close-in weapon systems, the torpedo defense systems and 7.62mm M134 machine guns were removed from the ship before its transfer to Brazil. The ship displaces 21.578 tons, is 203.43 meters long and has a range of 8,000 in miles. She has been undergoing maintenance work by Babcock and BAE System since February. Scheduled to reach its home port, Arsenal do Rio de Janeiro, AMRJ, on 25th of August, Atlantico will undergo operational sea training under the Royal Navy's Flag Officer Sea Training, FOST, program. It was reported in 2017 that Brazil was interested in purchasing Ocean from the UK as a replacement for which was withdrawn from service in 2017 following multiple mechanical failures. The Royal Navy released an asking price of £80.3 million, US dollars, which the Brazilian Navy called convenient. In December 2017, the Brazilian Navy confirmed the purchase of Ocean for GBP. 84.6 million pounds, equivalent to 359.5 million Brazilian EISH and 113.2 million US dollars. The ship was decommissioned from Royal Navy service in March 2018, and after undertaking a period of maintenance in the United Kingdom, is expected to arrive in Rio de Janeiro by the end of 2018 with the intention of being fully operational by 2020. One Stobar Carrier was originally built as the 57,000-ton Soviet carrier Vryag and was later purchased as a stripped hulk by China in 1998 on the pretext of use as a floating casino, then partially rebuilt and towed to China for completion. Liaoning was commissioned on September 25, 2012, and began service for testing and training. On 24 November 25, 2012, Liaoning successfully launched and recovered several Shenyang J-15 jet fighter aircraft. She is classified as a training ship intended to allow the Navy to practice with carrier usage. On December 26, 2012, the People's Daily reported that it will take four to five years for Liaoning to reach full capacity, mainly due to training and coordination which will take significant amount of time for Chinese PLA Navy to complete as this is the first aircraft carrier in their possession. As she is a training ship, Liaoning is not assigned to any of China's operation fleets. A second carrier was launched on April 26, 2017. She is the first to be built domestically, to a modified Kuznetsov class design. The Type 001A aircraft carrier started sea trials on April 23, 2018. Ref name equals SCMP 418 slash ref and is scheduled to enter service in 2020. Chinese officials stated that a third carrier, also known as Type 002 carrier, is being constructed in the Shanghai Jiangnan shipyard. She will be the first Chinese aircraft carrier to use catapult takeoff system. Egypt signed a contract with French shipbuilder DCNS to buy two helicopter carriers for approximately 950 million euros. The two ships were originally destined for Russia, but the deal was cancelled by France due to Russian involvement in Ukraine. On June 2, 2016, Egypt received the first of two helicopter carriers acquired in October 2015, the landing helicopter dock. The flag transfer ceremony took place in the presence of Egyptian and French Navy's chiefs of staff. Chairman and Chief Executive Officers of both DCNS and France, and senior Egyptian and French officials. On September 16, 2016, DCNS delivered the second of two helicopter carriers, the landing helicopter dock which also participated in a joint exercise with the French Navy before arriving at its home port of Alexandria. Egypt is the first and so far only country in Africa or the Middle East to possess an aircraft carrier. One Katabar carrier is a 42,000-ton nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, commissioned in 2001 and is the flagship of the French Navy, Marine Nationale. The ship carries a complement of Dassault Rafale M and E2C Hawkeye aircraft, EC-725 Caracal and AS-532 Cougar helicopters for combat search and rescue, as well as modern electronics and Aster missiles. She is a catabar type carrier that uses two 75m C-13-3 steam catapults of a shorter version of the catapult system installed on the U.S. carriers, one catapult at the bow and one across the front of the landing area. Three amphibious assault ships, 21,500-ton full-deck amphibious assault ships with hospital and well-deck. 
one Stobar carrier, 45,400 tons, modified Kiev class. The carrier was purchased by India on January 20, 2004 after years of negotiations at a final price of $2.35 billion. The ship successfully completed her sea trials in July 2013 and aviation trials in September 2013. She was formally commissioned on 16 November 2013 at a ceremony held at Sivirodvinsk, Russia. India started the construction of a 40,000-ton, aircraft carrier in 2009. The new carrier will operate MiG-29K and naval HAL Tejas aircraft along with the Indian MATA helicopter HAL Dhruv. The ship will be powered by four gas turbine engines and will have a range of, carrying 160 officers, 1,400 sailors, and 40 aircraft. The carrier is being constructed by coach and shipyard. The ship was launched in August 2013 and is scheduled for commissioning in 2018. A second Vikram class carrier with a displacement of over 65,000 tons is planned and likely to be nuclear powered with Katabar system to launch and recover heavier aircraft and unmanned combat aircraft. The project is in the design phase. Two Stovel carriers, four helicopter carriers, one Stobar carrier, Admiral Flota Savetskovo Soyuza Kuznetsov, 55,000 ton Stobar aircraft carrier. Launched in 1985 as Tbilisi. Renamed and operational from 1995. Without catapult she can launch and recover lightly fueled naval fighters for air defense or anti-ship missions but not heavy conventional bombing strikes. Officially designated an aircraft carrying cruiser, she is unique in carrying a heavy cruiser's complement of defensive weapons and large P-700 Granite offensive missiles. The P-700 systems will be removed in the coming refit to enlarge her below-decks aviation facilities as well as upgrading her defensive systems. The Russian government just recently gave the green light for the construction of the Sturm class aircraft carrier. This carrier will be a hybrid of Katabar and Stobar, given the fact that she utilizes both systems of launching aircraft. The carrier is expected to cost between $1.8 billion and $5.63 billion. Once commissioned, she will replace Admiral Kuznetsov. One 18,860-ton full-deck amphibious assault ship with hospital and well-deck and facilities to serve as fleet flagship. South Korea believes it can procure two light aircraft carriers by 2036, which will help make the Rockna Blue Water Navy. TCG Anadolu L-408 is a planned amphibious assault ship, LHD, of the Turkish Navy that can be configured as a light aircraft carrier. Construction began on April 30, 2016 by Sedef Shipbuilding Incorporated at their Istanbul shipyard and is expected to be completed in 2021. One offshore helicopter support ship, helicopter carrier, 11,400 ton Stovel carrier based on Spanish design. Commissioned in 1997. The AV 8S Matador slash Harrier Stovel fighter wing, mostly inoperable by 1999 was retired from service without replacement in 2006. Ship now used for royal transport, helicopter operations, and as a disaster relief platform. One Stovel carrier, the 65,000 ton was commissioned in December 2017 with initial operating capability scheduled for 2020. The Royal Navy is constructing the second of its larger Stovel aircraft carriers, to complete replacement of the three now retired carriers. Prince of Wales sailed for the first time in late 2017 and is expected to begin sea trials in 2019. Each Queen Elizabeth class ship is able to operate around 40 aircraft during peacetime operations, up to 50 during wartime, and will have a displacement of 65,000 tons. 11 Katabar carriers, all nuclear powered. 9 amphibious assault ships carrying vehicles, marine fighters, attack and transport helicopters and landing craft with Stovel fighters for CAS and CAP. The current U.S. fleet of Nimitz-class carriers will be followed into service, and in some cases replaced, by the It is expected that the ships will be more automated in an effort to reduce the amount of funding required to maintain and operate the vessels. The main new features are implementation of electromagnetic aircraft launch system, IMLs, which replace the old steam catapults, and unmanned aerial vehicles. Following the deactivation of in December 2012, the U.S. fleet comprised 10 fleet carriers, but that number increased back to 11 with the commissioning of Gerald R. Ford in July 2017. The House Armed Services Sea Power Subcommittee on July 24, 2007, recommended seven or eight new carriers, one every four years. 
However, the debate has deepened over budgeting for the $12 to $14.5 billion, plus $12 billion for development and research, for the 100,000-ton Gerald R. Ford class carrier, estimated service 2017, compared to the smaller $2 billion 45,000-ton S, which are able to deploy squadrons of F-35 BS. The first of this class, is now in active service with another, under construction and nine more are planned. In a report to Congress in February 2018, the Navy stated it intends to maintain a 12 CBN force as part of its 30-year acquisition plan. A few aircraft carriers have been preserved as museum ships. They are. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.